Hey, what's up, guys? This is Pastor Scott, and we're just so thankful that you chose to be with us online or on live stream. And, and we hope you are encouraged. We hope you're convicted. Uh, but we also hope that you grow closer to Jesus, because that's our main goal. But doing this, it does cost us money. And so uh, if you consider this your home church online, um, or you're just checking us out, if you would be led by the Spirit to give us a gift, then we'd appreciate it. But I want to make it also very clear that if this was just sent to you by a friend, or, or you just listen to us sometimes, please just give to your home church. We never want to take um, the finances and the resources that people need at your church. And so please, just give to your home church, and uh, we'll gladly just inspire you with these messages. Um, but if you would like to give us a gift, you can go on our app, or you can go on our website, and uh, you can give online. So again, thank you so much. We love you, and we hope that you grow closer to Jesus through this. All right. How good was that? That was awesome. That was so sweet. This is something we usually do to you before the message at Kids in the Zoo. I'm going to say God is good. You're going to say all the time. And then I'm going to say all the time, you're going to say, God is good. Ready? God is good. And all the time. God is good. Can we just do that one more? That was so cool. God is good. And all the time. God is good. Oh, man, this is so cool. Um, my name is Joey Spolstra, and I'm the director of student ministries here at Zootown. Four years ago, I started out as a kids pastor, and now I'm just kind of overseeing. Currently and up to date is Pete uh, and his wife, Paige. They are pastoring, directing, facilitating our kids' ministry uh, currently, and they're just doing a phenomenal job uh, doing it. Can we just give these guys a round of applause really quick? You guys are crushing it. Awesome, awesome job. Uh, yeah, it was, it was just so cool and humbling to be a part of it uh, four years ago, um, and just such a sweet journey to see this kids ministry grow, to see, as a result, our youth ministry grow as, as kids are, you know, becoming uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers. Just really, really sweet, honored to be a part of it. Um, my wife and I, we currently have a one-year-old and another one on the way, and uh, yep, it's... Uh, I'm not going to say a thing. Um, God's plan, super good. We're thrilled. Uh, we just weren't really expecting it. But currently, we got a one-year-old, and his first day is in the one-year-old classroom at Kids in the Zoo. So he's even reaping the benefits of so much just faithfulness and labor from so many of you guys, servants, leaders, uh, who have uh, participated and have contributed to our, our kids' ministry. So we're just so, so thankful from the bottom of our hearts for all of you guys who have been involved in it and just seeing God just take this to the next level. And it's just awesome to be a part of it. What I'm going to share briefly with you guys is just kind of a big picture, vision, direction, passion. Uh, Peach is going to share kind of more of the practical, what is being taught, what is happening behind this stage, behind the scenes. So if you guys want to turn to Matthew chapter 19, we're going to be in verses 13 through 15 briefly. If you don't have a Bible, it's all right. We got these scriptures on the screen. If you guys want to read along with me, that would be, that'd be awesome. It says this. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. But Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. And this passage just so beautifully illustrates and, and just kind of corresponds with, with what God was already kind of putting on my heart as well for this kids' ministry. And this passage just kind of talks about three groups of people of, of the utmost of priority. One group in this passage are the parents, the parents that brought their kids to Jesus. The other group of people are the disciples, the followers of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' closest friends, they've been following him for a couple years at this point. And the last group is the group that we see the interaction of Jesus and the kids taking place in this passage. So, so this kind of breaks down what's on my heart and what is really in the heart of this ministry, these three groups of people and the interaction that we see in this passage. In verse 13, it says that the parents brought their kids to Jesus. And I just want to stop there really quick because much of our ministry is focused on you parents. 
As much of this ministry is for the kids, this ministry is for you guys as well. And there's just a couple things I want to clarify and, and really encourage you parents in is that our, our kids' ministry, it is in fact a ministry and not a daycare. Now, we do love your kids. We love you. We care for them. We'll try to keep them happy and feed them gluten-free Cheerios, not just Cheerios, gluten-free Cheerios and, and animal crackers. And, you know, we, we do care for them, especially in our nursery classrooms, zero to 11 months classroom, 12 to 23, even some of our two. We care for them. We love them. We pray for them. And that is just the extent and the nature of those classrooms. But starting in the two and, and, and entering into the three-year-old classroom, the four- and five-year-old classroom, especially with our elementary K through fifth, it is a ministry. So parents, rest assured and be encouraged in the fact that you are dropping your kids off in a ministry with a bunch of individuals, leaders who are trained, background-checked, and passionate to minister to your kids about the truth of who Jesus is and who they are in his sight. So this is a ministry, we, we love them, we care for them, but it is in our heart, burning in our heart, that we teach and minister and model Jesus to these kids. And the other thing I wanna clarify in that is that kids in the zoo will never become the primary spiritual voice and leadership in your kid's life. Because parents, we believe that that's you. We believe, parents, that you are the primary voice and influence and leadership for your kids in so many areas of life. But in, in scripture, we, we see that parents, you are not only entrusted, but you, you have received this gift and you also have a responsibility to lead your kids, to talk with your kids, to, to minister to your kids, to disciple your kids, to live, love, and look like Jesus, for your kids to see the model of, of which you live by, to, to hear the instruction of which you give them. You are the primary spiritual voice in your kid's life. And parents, we are so proud of you. We love you. We are in support of you, and we are here for you. Parents, you are crushing it. You're doing an excellent job. We love you. And we will never become the primary, primary voice um, of, of spiritual influence in the lives of your kids. We only want to be the secondary voice that already echoes the voice that you have in your home, the voice that you have in the lives of your kids. So parents, you play such a huge part as we pray and as we go about this ministry. We love you. We believe in you guys. We believe in you. And I just want you to know, maybe there are days where you don't feel equipped to be the primary leader and, and voice and influence in your kid's life. But I promise you, if God has given you a calling to be a parent, he will equip you to do so. You have everything you already need in Jesus. And you guys are excellent, excellent parents. The other group of people I see in this story that continues this, this passion, this layout of, of the direction of our kids' ministry are the disciples. Now, in this particular circumstance, the disciples, I think the pride within their heart kind of got the best of them in this moment. Because the disciples in this moment, they didn't serve as a help for, G for kids to interact with Jesus. They kind of served as a hindrance for kids to experience Jesus, right? Like, like in the minds of these disciples, they're probably thinking something along the lines of, you know what, Jesus has probably more important places to go. Jesus has more important people to be with. Like, like parents, kids, don't, don't, don't bother him, right? He's got, he's got business to, to do. And here we see that pride getting the best of them, they actually served more as a hindrance than a help for kids to experience Jesus, now, I read this passage not thinking that this church will become a hindrance for kids to experience Jesus, but I see the opportunity for this church, for many more disciples of Christ, not to be a hindrance, but to be a help for many more hundreds and even thousands of kids to experience Jesus here in Missoula. Do you guys want that? You guys want to be a part of that? Man, this is so awesome that we have a chance not to be a hindrance, but to be a help. There's two really practical things that, that could be a huge help in this kid's ministry. A couple of things that God was just put in my heart. One is finances. One is finances. And this doesn't have to be a crazy number. This doesn't have to be a crazy goal. The, the truth is we would love, 
we would love to renovate our warehouse space. Can you guys raise your hand if you've seen our warehouse space? If you haven't, it's on the other side of the lobby, on the other side of a small little worship room. It's at the end of our church building over there. I encourage you guys after service, go walk through it, get pumped because that space one day will be our, our kids and youth space. And we're so looking forward to that. Right now, what has served as a natural hindrance what has served as kind of a ceiling, it's, it's really capped the growth of our kids' ministry is the current space that we have. How many of you guys have seen our, our kids' space? Once again, if you have it, you can go over there, our check-in leader, supervisor, they'll get you a guest badge. You can kind of browse through that space. It's pretty small. It's pretty small. It's not anything fancy. And we're hosting 200 plus kids every single week. And I don't think it's our heart to hinder these kids from experiencing Jesus, but, but the truth is the nature of the space that we have, we can only host so many kids and have them experience Jesus at this place in this building. So we wanna expand and blow the roof off that, off that ceiling, and we wanna expand and blow through what, what we can currently host, and we wanna expand our influence and expand the opportunity for more kids to experience Jesus. We want that, that place to be modeled. We want that place to be constructed. We want that warehouse to be an amazing facility so hundreds of more kids can experience Jesus in this place. The other thing that I see is something really practical is the opportunity, once again, to not be a hindrance, but to be a help. And the practical step that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about right now is serving. It is something so easy and so practical just to give a, a, a service or maybe two services a month to be back there with the kids. Man, the fact is if we have 200 plus kids and if it takes a village to raise a kid, we need a pretty big village back there helping. <laughs> we need a lot of help. And the truth is, like, like, there's a lot of circumstances that happen, right? Like women, uh, so, so many moms in our in our kids' ministry, they become pregnant, they, they give birth, their family unit's growing, they can't necessarily serve to the capacity that they were once serving before. People move. Um, a lot of our volunteers are, are college-age adults, and so they're gone during Christmas break, they're, done, they're gone during the summer, and so there's just kind of always, not only a need, but always an opportunity for you guys to be a part of what's happening. And I just want to I just wanna pump you up in this. Like you guys just saw a little glimpse of what happens back at Kids in the Zoo every week. Do you guys wanna be a part of something this special? I, I've, I've seen God do crazy things and grow faith, faith that can move mountains in our kids' ministry. And so this is something super easy, super practical. If, if God is leading you, to give a small financial gift just in the constant contribution and, and building our fund for the building project, I, I just, I encourage you to, to give. And if God is leading you to be a part of this ministry, I encourage you to sign up. Both of these things can be done at the hello booth in the lobby. And here, here's, here's really quick, as I, as I wrap up and Pete's able to kind of take the rest of the message, here's the last group of people that I see and I just wanna end on this and I wanna celebrate this. I wanna fire you guys up as well. The last group I see is the interaction of Jesus and the children. And in this moment, it says that Jesus, he placed his hands on their head and he blessed them before he left. Church, I, I gotta communicate this to you. Jesus has greatly blessed so many children here at Zootown Church. Four years ago, I came in with little faith, and I came in with the mentality of, you know what, I'm just gonna sow some seeds, I'm just gonna preach the word, like we're just gonna be sowing. Pete kinda came in with the mentality of, well, you know, we're, we're just gonna sow. But throughout the years, both Pete and I have been able to witness, not only have we have the privilege to sow, and the privilege to water, and the privilege to encourage these kids in the Lord, but we have had the humbling opportunity to see Jesus grow fruit and have fruit be displayed and the lives of these kids a part of this ministry. You guys just saw a childlike worship that has the power to shut Satan's mouth. This was on full display. 
Kids dancing, kids singing, kids giving Jesus everything that they have. That is incredible fruit to be seen. We've seen kids place their faith in Jesus. We've seen kids profess this faith in front of their church family and get baptized. We have heard again and again and again these kids witnessing in their schools. It's, it's, it's crazy. We've seen relationships and friendships happen between leaders and, and students and, and even these, these students amongst themselves. I've, I believe these friendships are, are life-changing and these are friendships that are gonna be lifelong. There's been so much fruit that has happened in this kid's ministry. And Jesus is blessing these kids. So from my heart, from Pete's heart, this is, this is the big picture. This is the big vision. This is our, our desire for this kid's ministry. Pete's gonna kind of walk you through in more detail what that looks like back there. Yeah, we are, uh, like Joey's saying, we're, we're really, really blessed uh, to, to be a part of a church that has a kids ministry like this, that, that's active and, and, uh, and, and is influencing these kids' lives. There's, there's about 50 to 60 leaders each and every Sunday that are back there making kids in the zoo happen, leading and loving kids, uh, spending their time and effort and energy just pouring in to investing into that uh, ministry. And it's, it's really, really powerful stuff. Uh, and, it, and it's kind of funny sometimes. I think back when I was growing up, when I was a kid, uh, my dear mother sat with myself and my, my little brother Ben in church in between us. And if you've seen me and my little brother Ben, we're constantly punching each other, tackling each other. One time we were in the store with Paige and, and we were like, ended up on the ground because we're wrestling. And that was like two months ago. I mean, it wasn't very long ago. And so my mom had to sit between us in church because we didn't really have a kids ministry in our church. You know, and my dad was the pastor and he's having to like discipline us from the pulpit, you know, and so it's kind of awkward. So we are so blessed to be a part of a church where, where parents can just drop their kids off, come and, and hear a word from God and enjoy God's presence. We're very, very blessed. Uh, and, and like Joey said, our main goal at Kids in the Zoo is that kids would come to Jesus and that they would encounter him for themselves. And, and our ultimate hope is that they would eventually place their faith in Jesus at whatever stage that that comes uh, according to God's timing. Um, but in order for that to happen, in order for kids to place their faith in Jesus, they gotta hear about him. And so that's one of the main things that we do at Kids in the Zoo, along with a lot of other things that are very important, but the most important thing that we can do is share with them the truth of God's word. The Apostle Paul in Romans 1, he says, I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. We believe here at Zootown Church that the good news of Christ, that God sent his one and only son into the world to rescue us and to restore his heavenly kingdom to the earth, we believe that that good news, it's good. In a world full of bad news, we are very, very much excited about this good news that we get to share with anyone and everyone who will hear it. This good news about the most influential man who has ever lived in the history of the world, and he's not even here today, and we're still talking about him. This good news is the news that we share at Kids in the Zoo. We teach kids truth. We, we, we open up our Bibles. We try to teach them that all these Bible stories are about one big story that points to and centers on God's son, Jesus, and that they need to meet Jesus. Because once you meet the king, you start to understand what life is like in his kingdom. So we, we really, really hammer home a lot of this each and every week. Uh, with two-year-olds, they can barely talk, but we still tell them about Jesus. Even if it's for a couple of minutes, we still tell them about Jesus. I was in there one week and I asked all the two-year-olds and, and at that moment, I didn't, hit, didn't realize, oh, these guys can't talk, <laughs> you know, I mean, and so I'm trying to communicate with them the good news and I'm like, Does, do you guys know Jesus? And a few two-year-olds went, oh. I was like, they know, <laughs> they know him. So we tell the gospel to two-year-olds. We tell it to three-year-olds, to four-year-olds, to five-year-olds, all the way up K through fifth grade. We tell them the good news of Jesus. 
in, in, in two primary areas that we focus on, just for a broad overview of what we do teach kids, uh, what we find in scriptures, we teach them, number one, truth about God, who God is, and number two, truth about themselves. Because I believe this is the most important thing about anybody, is, is your view of God and your view of yourself. It, it's those two things that'll direct your course of life and it'll determine your quality of life, is how do you view God and how do you view yourself? And they're very closely connected. And those are two things we open up the scriptures to teach kids about and pray and hope that the Holy Spirit does his thing to, to put it into their hearts. Uh, teach them truth about God. We say and teach God is good. Every single week we say that, that God is good. He's good all the time. And all the time, he is good. He can't not be good because if he stopped being good, he'd stop being God. He's only and always good. Tell kids that, hey, not everything that happens is good. We live in a world where not everything is good, where evil and sin and suffering are present, but even though that, that may be circumstances that, that people may be in, that doesn't change who God is. So we teach him God is good. We teach him God is faithful, that God never goes back on his promises. He has never promised something and then not kept his promise. He's never started a work that he didn't finish. He's faithful. He can be trusted. We teach kids that God's eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's God. We're not. He created everything. All things came from God. In the beginning was God. Before the beginning, God was. He has always existed. We teach kids God's eternal. And there's nothing cooler when you get down and you teach a kid God had no beginning. And they just go, there's nothing better than that. We teach kids that God is all powerful. You can't measure God's strength. Nobody can get in a bench press competition with God. He's so strong. We tell kids that God is knowing every, he knows everything. He's all knowing, he's all wise. We teach kids God is a judge who's fair. God is not unfair, God is fair. He's the most fair person of anyone. We teach kids these truths because we want them to know who God is. We teach kids that God cares about them. We teach kids God's not just some big, powerful guy in the sky, but that he's a loving father who cares about you very, very much. Every little detail in your life he cares about. We teach these kids these things. We teach them God is a father, he's a son, he's the Holy Spirit. He's three persons in one being. We teach kids that God the Father sent his son into the world to reveal him to the world that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. If we wanna know what God is like, what God thinks, how God feels, how God would act in certain situations, we see Jesus in the Gospels and we see who God is. We teach kids that Jesus came and he lived a perfect life, sinless, empowered by the Holy Spirit, perfectly and continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Everywhere Jesus goes, the power and presence of God goes. And we teach kids this about Jesus because when you know about Jesus, you start to understand what the Holy Spirit's activity is. And Jesus came, lived, died, and rose again for the ultimate purpose to send his spirit who's here with us now, right here. We teach kids these things about God because we want them to know the truth about who God is. We teach kids truth about who they are. We teach them about design, that they are designed in the image of God, that they carry great value because they carry their father's name. Just like Nike is a more expensive shirt than a, no, a, a brand, a not, a, a, what am I saying? A, 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 a no name brand shirt, you know, like the shirts just with nothing on them. Nike's more expensive because it's got that name brand. So it is with these kids and we say, man, you are valuable because you carry your father's image. He designed you. You're not an accident. You're not a coincidence. You, you were the plan of God and he wants you on this planet to show the world what he is like. You were made to be like him. That's your ultimate purpose. We teach kids about sin. We tell them the hard truths that maybe we don't necessarily want to hear, but we need to hear. We do tell kids that everybody everywhere has been corrupted by sin, and we have a terminal illness and disease that we need cured of. <laughs> we need help, and we don't tell kids they're perfect. We say, Jesus is perfect, and you need him. 
So we teach kids also about identity, and this is one of my favorites because I think identity is one of the most important things you could ever learn about, is who you are. There's a lot of people who, who, who have, have progressed in life and, and they still don't know who they are. We wanna get to kids when they're young and tell them who they are, that you are not defined by your sin. What you do does not define you. What Jesus did defines who you are. And so now what you do is simply a byproduct of who you are. So when you understand who you are, you start to act like who you really are and who God intended you to be. We teach kids about identity, that because of Jesus and your faith in him, you're united to him. Therefore, you are a son and daughter of God. And that is a permanent thing that doesn't change. And you will always be that. You will always be God's child. We teach kids about identity. We teach them about purpose that we have a reason for existence, that you sitting here in this room today, you have a purpose. You're not just living and breathing to death. You have a reason that you're here. We teach kids about that reason, that ultimately you're here to be loved by your father and display him to the world. We teach kids about purpose. We teach kids about destiny. Beyond the grave, what happens? A lot of people, we still don't know. But because of Jesus, because he came and he rose from the dead, and that was a historical event that hundreds of people witnessed in the same town that he was crucified in, we tell kids, because of the resurrection of Jesus, your destiny is beyond the grave, there's hope. We teach kids that, hey, we're not just gonna be up in the sky like with a bunch of chubby babies playing harps, singing praises. We teach kids that, man, our destiny is to rule and reign in God's kingdom alongside Jesus for eternity. That was his plan from the beginning. When in Genesis 1, God said, let them have dominion. He said that to man. And that's our destiny because God's word can't be broken. These are some of the things we teach kids about, about God and about themselves. But what's so, so cool is when you see that truth solidify in kids' hearts. I've even just the past few weeks heard stories of kids uh, who are just so bold in their faith. Th there's kids that, that we've heard stories of just through parents and the grapevine, kids in their schools who are teaching, they're teaching their teachers about Jesus. There's kids who get on their bus and their bus drivers experiencing Jesus through this little child. And it's so, so cool to see the boldness of little kids who are unashamed of the good news about Jesus. And somewhere along the line, we all grew up and we started to be more concerned about what other people think rather than what our father thinks. And it's so cool to see childlike faith just say, man, I, December is about Jesus. December is about when Jesus was born. And it's so cool to just see that, just spread that, that childlike boldness. There's, there's one example of a story of a, of a kid who um, came up to me about a couple years ago. He's about six, seven years old. Uh, and it's a story I'll never forget. It's, it was really, really simple. I mean, it was nothing super spectacular, but it was not just what this kid said to me, but it was how he said it. And that morning we had a message about how God is our treasure, that Jesus is the most valuable thing you could ever think of, that there's nothing more valuable than Jesus. After this message, this kid comes up to me just with confidence in his eyes, bold, chest puffed out, looking like Superman on top of a building, cape flowing. He came up to me and he goes, I accepted Jesus. And I looked at him and I said, you are filthy rich. And if you could just see the smile on this boy's face as he walked off, he just, yes, I am. And I, I, this impacted me so much because I'm thinking I'm coming into kids in the zoo to teach kids about Jesus and about faith and all of a sudden these roles are reversed and I become the student and this kid becomes the teacher and his faith preached to me a message that was more powerful than any pastor I had ever heard. It was not just what this boy said but how he said it. He really believed what he said. And he, man, he knew more than many adults know who have graduated college, who have gotten PhDs, who have become professionals. This boy knew who he belonged to. He knew, I'm a son of God. He knew, I have been bought with the blood of Jesus. He knew, I got the Holy Spirit living inside me and he ain't going nowhere. He knew, without a shadow of a doubt, and this kid's faith was just exploding out of his heart and it was so, so cool. 
reminded me of Jesus when he says, in Matthew 18, he says, I tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says to his disciples who are all, you know, somehow pride kicks in when we get older and we start to think we're really important. And, you know, the disciples were arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus is going, no, no, no. All right, here we go. I got to get a good illustration. He brings a kid in front of him. He said, he's the greatest. You got to become like him to get in. And unless you become like a child, you don't get in. Because in the doorway to enter God's kingdom, it says, be like a child. And you enter through that doorway through humility. But I think somewhere along the line, when we follow Jesus, we start to think, okay, I was a child when I got in. Now I'm going to start to be a grown up. When you don't grow out of being a child, I was thinking, man, I'm 27 years old and I'm still a son of my dad. And in 10 years, I'm still going to be my dad's son. You don't grow out of being a child. And I think that Jesus said you got to become like children is because that's how you enter, but that's, that's how you live in the kingdom, is you are a child. That's who you really are. Not a pastor, not a lawyer, not a teacher, not a mechanic, not a fast food worker. You are a son and a daughter, and that is your forever permanent identity. You're loved by God. He's your father. That's who you are. Jesus was 30-some years old, grown man with a beard. And he would always refer to God, creator, Jehovah, Yahweh. He would refer to this great God as his Abba Father. That word Abba was, was a word that little kids would use to refer to their dads. So Jesus is walking around with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit saying, God's my papa. And this, and this was revolutionary because it's so simple. <laughs> it's so simple. He's my dad and he loves me. And that's where I'm living from. And so today we have this message, we have this service to, to remind us we need to be like children. But I think that... Um, it's really interesting the season that we're in because we celebrate how Jesus was born on Christmas. And I think the reason that children have a special place in God's heart is because God became a child. God was born as a baby. That baby became a toddler. That baby became a boy. That baby became a grown man through the teenage years. He grew as a man. That was God in a body. God was a child. And in Galatians 4, it says this. When the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. Christmas. Jesus was born. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to cry out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. And what's so powerful about this is that God himself became a child so that we could become his children. There's a really smart guy, theologian. He said that the son of God became a son of man so that men might become sons of God. This is incredible. <laughs> What else? What other message is this? This is why we celebrate Christmas. God became a child. If God can become a child, I can too. And this is so, so amazing. And this is all made possible because this baby that was born in the major, this baby's destiny was the cross. And it was through the cross and through his death and through the shedding of his blood and the breaking of his body that he would make many slaves sons. Many lost would become found. Many orphans would become adopted into the royal family and they'd have a seat at the royal table with their dad. So Scott's gonna come forward and he's gonna uh, talk through communion. We got a chance for communion with 
uh, some of you parents and your kids. This will be a really special time for you guys. Um, Scott's gonna talk through just what this means. Uh, so we've been kind of communicating this a little bit this week. So some of you parents, if you want to take this time with your kids to take communion with them, some of these kids, it might be your first time taking communion. And it's a really, really special moment. And we want to uh, rehearse and remember what this is all about. Well, if you're going to take communion today, please come on up with your kids and grab the body and the blood of Jesus. Before I explain it, I hope you guys can feel pretty confident that your kids are in good hands with Joey and Pete. Amen? That's pretty good stuff right there. And their wives, Angie and Paige, I mean, it's just, that's, for a bunch of young guys like them, they are far beyond their years <laughs> in their maturity and their love for Jesus. So if you guys want to just wait up here too, uh, you don't have to go back to your seats, just kind of wait up here. And as I explain this, this is just a good reminder to all you guys out there too of what communion is all about and that um, we never should get tired of taking communion. That's at Zootown Church why we, we do it every single week is because we believe in it and we want that reminder every single week of God's love in our life. Um, and it's just an important thing. We don't want this to become just a religious act. We want this to be heartfelt every time. And so I, I just pray that this is a good, this week I was praying this was a good reminder to all you who've been Christians for a long time, um, that today you kind of rekindle that love for communion. Okay, so the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a common denominator for all of us, that we are all sinners and we've all messed up. So one thing I always think that we maybe shouldn't be so judgmental as we grow older kids, because we're all kind of in the same boat here together. But I love that it says it was a free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so what you're doing today is, you, this is a symbol that God gave you guys. It's a symbol of remembrance. This isn't a, a time to mourn, this is a time to rejoice for what Jesus has done for us. And it's a covenant that Jesus made with you guys. And the reason that's important is because I want you to know that in your lives, you will have troubles, you will sin, and you will go through different seasons. But this is the place that you can remember that you're God's kid. And it's a place that you can come running to no matter what sin you've done, no matter what, uh, where life has taken you, don't ever be ashamed of coming to the communion table. God is not ashamed of you. He sent his son to prove it. So if you ever wanna know how much God loves you, this is a wonderful symbol that Christ gave his disciples before he went to the cross. And the thing I love about that is his disciples were normal people, just like you and me. They were normal people. They weren't extra special. They're normal like us. And so this is a place that you can come, kids, no matter what, to know and remember you're a child of God. You're a child of God. You're a child of God. And don't let anything ever come in the way. Don't let any shame, don't let any guilt, no matter what you do, get in the way of coming and receiving what Christ has done for you. And so this is the body of Jesus. This is the symbol for you that he makes an everlasting covenant with you, a promise that, as Pete said, God never breaks his promises. So you have eternal life in Christ Jesus. No matter what happens on this planet, you have eternal life in Christ. So do this in remembrance of him.
This is symbolic for the blood of Jesus. It says that this seals you until the day of redemption. That means there's nothing that can ever take you from his grace. Kids, say nothing. How about a little louder? Nothing can ever take you from the grace of Jesus and the Father in heaven. You are kids forever. Come boldly to this table. And it's also a sign that you're, you're, you're drinking it, you're eating it. Jesus wants you to know you are one with him and he is one with you. And he will never be separated from you as long as you live. And you adults, remember that. If you've been along, if you've, if you've gone astray, if you're not living it, you're still one with him. <laughs> and the covenant is still real. The covenant was on his end, that he's the one who did it. And he will never break that covenant. And so do this. This is the blood of Jesus Christ. Do this in remembrance of him. Let me pray for you kids, all us kids, because we're all kids in this room. Jesus, I pray a special blessing upon these children who took communion today, and I pray that you remind them that never to grow up, never grow up, but just continually be a child of God, a son and a daughter of God. I pray that they receive these promises and that they live a life in these promises, Lord, knowing what their identity is, and knowing who you are, that God, you are good, but you are love. God is love. And thank you for this symbol. Thank you for this communion that we can partake in this and come boldly running to the throne of grace and receive your forgiveness and receive your promises over and over and over. Bless these children. Bless this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen.